The backbone of every functional democracy is a free and fair election in which the strongest candidate who has the biggest support from the majority of citizens, a candidate that potentially could beat any other candidate in a one-to-one -one matchup is elected into office. It sounds simple, and yet the electoral system in the United States is broken. It has resulted in what we've accepted as the status quo of our democracy, bipartisanship, runoff elections, bad candidates, voting for the lesser of two evils, swinging the vote, billions of dollars and years of our attention as a nation is wasted on presidential campaigns that are no better than for-profit sporting events, an event in which the citizens and not the politicians are the losers. All of these phenomena are symptoms of a broken electoral system. So how do we fix it? On Type 1 Planet, we're working to answer this existential question. Our guest in this episode, Aaron Hamlin, tells us there may be a solution to this puzzle. Aaron is the co-founder and executive director for the Center for Election Science, where they bolster a simple idea, approval voting. Put simply, every citizen has the, as many votes as there are candidates, and they can place a vote for all the candidates that they think can do the job. The candidate with the most overall votes wins. That's it. Sounds too good to be true, or is this the future of modern democracy? My name is Robert Roach, and this is the Type 1 Planet podcast. Watch or listen to this episode. Please subscribe, share it with someone who might become inspired, and visit us at type1planet.net. Hello, and welcome to the Type 1 Planet podcast. I'm Robert Roach, and today I'm joined by our guest, Aaron Hamlin, the Executive Director for the Center for Election Science. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so Aaron, the mission of Type 1 Planet, we're trying to reimagine and redesign our civilization so that we can enter into a long-term sustainable state that's in equilibrium with ourselves and with our planetary environment. And governance and population scale decision-making is an essential part of that transformation. So let's just start big picture first. Why is democracy important? Why is it successful and why is it flawed from your perspective? Well, uh, we have to make decisions at scale um, and democracy is the way that we do that. Um, and the thing is like you have to, when we're thinking about making decisions at scale, we have a bunch of people whose uh, values uh, and priorities that we have to consider. And we have to find a way to aggregate all that to, to make large decisions. Uh, democracy is what allows us to do that. And more specifically, uh, when we have um, particularly like a republic, when we designate uh, particularly individuals to make a bunch of the uh, more minute decisions for us in terms of like legislation uh, and so forth, uh, we uh, vote to decide who sits in those seats to who makes those uh, those decisions. And so when we make that decision, um, we use uh, what's called a, a voting method. Uh, and a voting method is made up of uh, multiple parts. Uh, one is the information that you provide on your ballot. Um, and there's all kinds of information you can provide there. You can pick one candidate, pick a whole bunch. Um, you can score them on a scale, you can rank them. And then you got to do something with that information. Um, so put it through some kind of algorithm um, that computes it using that information. And you can do all kinds of different um, things with that information and you get a result uh, from that. And that result is uh, the decision that we make for who sits in those seats to make those important decisions. Um, and the thing is, the way that we do that now is not so good. Uh, we, the, uh, the way we do it is we have a ballot and the ballot says pick one person. And then um, the algorithm, so to speak, is just adding everything up. And the candidate with the most votes uh, gets to sit in that seat. Um, the, the challenge with that is that if there are similar candidates running uh, and you can only pick one, well, the vote can divide between those candidates. And candidates who happen to just like not have anyone similar to them, um, they can wind up winning even if they're less popular just because their support isn't being divided. Uh, and fortunately, there are other ways to do that that are much better that make sure we make a better decision about who sits in those seats, um, which ultimately affects policy, how we spend large amounts of money, 
Um, and also that policy, like we want to be able to last a while. So we want a voting method that doesn't kind of uh, choose people all over the place. We want some consistency over time uh, to have some of these policies be sustainable. And so those are the kinds of things that we look at. Um, we have a particular voting method that we like to do that with, which is approval voting. Pick as many as you want. Most of it's wins. Um, we, but, and we do a bunch of research on all these voting methods. So let's go back to the negative trends by our current system for a little bit. So you mentioned one could, was what you were just describing in terms of that that uh, center person, for example, being his his votes being split. Is that is that vote splitting? I've seen another phrase on your in your writing called the center squeeze effect. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So the center squeeze effect is a type of vote splitting. Um, I, I think like a lot of times when we think about uh, vote splitting, like if you went and asked some random person and said like, uh, hey, uh, tell me what uh, vote splitting is. I think what they would likely do is they would say, okay, well, that's like when you have an independent or a third party and they're running and there's another major party candidate that's kind of similar to them in some ways and they divide the vote between them. And as a consequence, somebody else wins that maybe isn't as popular. I think that's how a lot of people would describe vote splitting. Um, but uh, uh, that's not the only way that it can happen. It can also happen from the middle. So like, imagine the previous scenario. Imagine like someone from like the Green Party, for instance, uh, running, and it's otherwise close between like a Democrat and Republican. The Democrat and Green Party candidate maybe split their vote a little bit, and the Republican kind of edges out over the Democratic Party candidate. So I think that's how, how a lot of people think about it. But you can imagine, and there, like the the vote splitting is happening from like one side of the Democratic uh, Party candidate. But you can imagine, say, um, some moderate uh, candidate uh, in the middle, um, and then you can have a candidate on the left and to the right uh, of that candidate, not too far out, but just kind of like uh, middle of the road left, middle of the road uh, right, and then you have someone like in the middle that really represents the center. Of that electorate. Uh, and in this case, the candidate in the middle will have their vote split from the left and from the right. And so uh, as a consequence, they'll have the fewest votes. Um, and if you just take a what we call a plurality or first past the post election, um, they'll have the fewest votes. And so they obviously won't win. But even if we take other approaches, so say uh, a lot of people look at elections and say, like, well, you know what, if we added a runoff, totally fine. You get a majority winner. Everything will be great. Runoff doesn't solve this problem. Uh, so that candidate uh, who has their vote split on either side, they still have the fewest votes. They have the fewest votes there. They're not making it to the next round. So even a runoff isn't helping them. Even if you use, say, like a, a ranking method and um, eliminate, eliminate the candidate with the fewest first choice votes, and then transfer their next choice preferences to the next candidate. We call this instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting. Even if you did that, well, that candidate in the center would have the fewest first choice votes. So they're still getting eliminated, even in this uh, ranked choice voting scenario. Um, so this vote splitting from the middle, the center squeeze effect, uh, is something that our choose one method uh, messes up, just like it messes up um, kind of like outliers splitting the vote. Uh, but it does a really bad job with uh, it in the middle. But even runoff systems and even simulated runoff systems don't address this center squeeze effect when you have vote splitting from either side of a middle candidate. And as a consequence, like you're getting more extreme candidates either moving on to the general uh, or uh, winning in the general who otherwise shouldn't be winning. This is so interesting because I've always heard of rank choice voting. And um, the, what was the other phrase that you used to refer to rank choice voting? Uh, instant runoff voting. They kind of rebranded it. Okay. Um, got it. But, yeah. <laughs> but all right. Instant runoff voting, rank choice voting. I've always heard of that as the solution um, mm -hmm. to all of our political woes. And uh, you'll hear it talked about a lot. But there's still the issue here. Maybe it's a human psychology issue that there's still one vote. You're, you have one vote as an individual, and that vote uh, must be used or and not wasted, I think, is is kind of, is that sort of the initial approach? And I, and I want to kind of dive into runoff voting a little bit, into runoff voting a little bit more, because I'm not quite sure I 100% understood. So 
why doesn't how does it stack up against, for example, approval voting? If, and and actually, if you want to, maybe we can describe approval voting first. Um, sure. Um, so the quick answer to your question is uh, approval voting is, is way better. It's easier to implement um, in terms of cost, uh, simplicity, it does a better job with uh, uh, identifying the correct winner. And it also more accurately captures candidate support, including candidates who don't win. So when... When I'm looking at voting methods, one of the things that I'm using to evaluate them, I use really three categories, three uh, factors. Um, one is the winner selection, uh, making sure that it identifies a good winner. And there are different ways of measuring that. Um, you could use it, measure it using like utility measures. You can uh, measure that using like if that candidate is able, able to beat everyone else head to head, if that candidate exists. Um, and then a second factor of the three is looking at the accuracy of support for all the candidates. And there are ways of doing that experimentally using control measures, uh, which we set up designs for. And uh, thirdly, just practicality and simplicity. Uh, so say your voting method does really well, but it only does it like a, like a mere uh, small uh, minuscule amount better than another method. And that other method is like super easy to implement. Well. If you're gaining uh, a trivial amount of utility in terms of winner and, and accuracy, but you're having to give up an enormous amount in terms of complexity, you take the simpler method. So we we keep all those factors under consideration. And uh, the the method that we advocate for that we see doing well in each of those three factors is a method called approval voting, which is just basically you pick all you like in terms of candidates and a candidate with the most votes wins. And that's so your it. your ballot card is you've got your list you've got your bubbles there maybe there's six candidates and you're like well actually I think these three candidates I would like any of these three and so you select all three you you fill in the bubbles for all three of those and then submit the ballot is that what it would look like physically okay. that's it yeah and the ballot's really easy too like you uh, it uses the same amount of space um, so for instance like with ranked choice voting which is and I'll explain how that works, which is you you rank all your candidates um, and then you look to see if any candidate has more than half of the first choice preferences. If yes, you've got a winner. If not, you look to the candidate who has the fewest first choice preferences and then you eliminate that candidate and you look at their next choice preference and then you transfer that next choice preference to the other candidate and treat that as a first choice preference now. Now you tally everything up again and you see who has the um, you see if anyone has more than half of the first choice preferences of the remaining ballots because some of these get exhausted over time. And if yes, you've got a winner. If not, you keep going through this process over and over again until um, out of the remaining ballots, because like not everyone ranks all the candidates, out of the remaining ballots, whether someone has more than uh, half of the first choice votes. Um, and so that's the instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting, which is kind of complicated. Most people like say they understand it, but like really when you ask them to do it, um, you'll come up with a significant number of people who look at it and say like, oh yeah, like you assign them points and like you allocate their points or um, you look to see who is able to beat everyone else head to head. Ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting does not do that. Like there are other, so one of the things that's kind of confusing with this labeling uh, so a bunch of folks thought it was a good idea to switch the name from instant runoff voting to ranked choice voting, um, I guess because it sounded better. And it kind of does. But the, the the thing that's kind of annoying about that is there's an entire class of voting methods that involve ranking. Instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting is just one of them. Um, so th there's one that involves translating rankings to points. That's called board account, not ranked choice voting. Uh, there's another one that involves uh, another kind of subclass within uh, ranking methods called Condorcet methods. And that does the pairwise comparisons, kind of like a round robin tournament among all the candidates. Um, mm. Also not ranked choice voting. Um, and so the I, I'm part of this going on is that uh, it kind of got kind of a overly general name that I think kind of caused confusion unnecessarily. It didn't need to um, to do that, but in any case, like that's ranked choice voting, which is uh, as you're 
going through and thinking about it more complicated um, in terms of like other alternatives, particularly approval voting, which is just pick all you like, most of it's wins. And just to, I heard you say the word Condorcet. I saw you sp- talk about a Condorcet winner, and that's a candidate who could beat any other candidate one to one. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Okay, but it doesn't it. always exist. Like uh, sometimes that candidate is just not present. Okay, okay. So in that case, but if that candidate does exist, you want a system that would pull that candidate out. Um, uh, generally, yeah. General. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Th- th- this the stuff is a little bit complicated so I'll, I'll talk in like generalities for for the for the most part and not uh try not to get folks too confused okay but um and 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 some level of technicality is encouraged because i'm here to learn and and hopefully anyone who is listening can walk away and go to the dinner table tonight and say uh well let me tell you about this voting method um so let's talk about approval come back to approval voting so we i, I put in my ballot i've selected my three out of six candidates uh all the ballots are cast. Now you have essentially six numbers of how many dots were filled for each candidate across all the ballots. Is that kind of, and then are those numbers compared and that's how you find your winner? Is is it that simple? For uh, ranked choice voting, you're asking? Oh, I'm sorry, for approval voting. Um, so if I am voting for multiple candidates and everyone is voting for multiple candidates, then mm-hmm. all of those votes, you know, are counted up uh, and the, the technical, the, you know, the amount of votes that are counted up will be more than the population, right? Because each person is voting for more than one person. Um, yeah. But then there's that final number of how many votes were allocated to each candidate. And is that the, the, the way that they get elected? Is it that simple? Yeah, it's just that simple. And you can, um, in terms of like kind of visual appeal, um, typically the way that we encourage people to show the results like that, you get, you get your clear winner that way. Um, but typically the way that we ask people to show the results is the, uh, number of approvals, uh, for a particular candidate over the number of ballots cast, uh, in that particular, uh, race. Um, and, uh, that'll give you the, the percentage of voters who approved that candidate, which is kind of a more meaningful number. Uh, interesting. Interesting. So you'll have a percentage for each candidate mm-hmm. and, and those percentages won't add up to a hundred. They're going to be, well, will they add up to a hundred? <laughs> so uh, you can, you can take the total percentage and uh, of the total approval percentage uh, for each candidate. When you add all those up, um, you'll likely add up uh, a number that's greater than a uh, hundred <clears throat> And uh, uh, that number uh, divided by 100 will be the average votes per ballot uh, Mm -hmm. as well. So you can see the average number of uh, candidates that each voter chose per ballot. Okay. Okay. Got it. So bringing us back to those negative trends we were talking about, hyper-partisanship, tactical voting, vote splitting, center squeeze effect. How does approval voting address these? You know, uh, in might be really simple, but, you know, if you were to kind of describe how it does that. Yeah. So in this case, like say there were three candidates running and um, say it's kind of a close election and say you're a little bit center right. And uh, what you would do is you would choose the candidate. Well, first off, you choose your favorite, um, which you can always do under approval voting. Not a given with a voting method that you can do that like instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting, for example, there are cases where you can get a worse outcome by ranking your favorite as first, but not the case for approval voting. You can always support your honest favorite. So say you've got three candidates, one is center left, one is middle, and one is center right. Say you find yourself center right as a voter, you would support the center uh, right candidate because it's your your favorite. Um, And then what you can do, uh, particularly if it's a close election, You can see like, okay, well, I really don't want that center left candidate to win. It's my least favorite candidate. Um, And so I will hedge against that by also supporting the uh, center candidate, who's not super far away from where I'm at anyway. And if they won, I would still be uh, fine with that. Um, And so as a voter, you would support the the center candidate and the center right right candidate. That would be kind of your your, uh, logical uh, vote as a voter um so i see i see okay 
Now, and what you're doing there, you're hedging to make sure that that center left candidate doesn't win. Uh, and so you get that happening on uh, both sides. So say like, imagine you have a friend who's center left. Well, uh, they wouldn't want the center, uh, the kind of moderate right candidate to, to win. So they would vote for the candidate uh, on the kind of center left and the candidate in the center to make sure that the candidate on the far right um, wasn't able to, to win. Yeah, is current election technology, and we'll dive into election technology a little bit more in a bit, but is it easily transferable? Is it easily transferable to this kind of method? You know, what sort of potential changes would need to be made to our infrastructure to implement approval voting? Uh, really nothing. So it, it's super easy to implement, which is very convenient. Uh, so for example, we uh, have worked with local partners in two cities uh, so far in um, Fargo, North Dakota, and St. Louis, Missouri, both of them had issues with voting machines and like you get new software and stuff, like it can be super expensive. Um, there's all kinds of extra testing that you uh, often need to do. But with approval voting, they're already set up to do this. So for example, in many city council races, like they have it set up so that you can pick more than one candidate. So like that kind of tells you right away that voting methods are capable of handling uh, a voter being able to select more than one candidate in a particular race. And when this passed in St. Louis, for example, uh, via a ballot initiative that passed by like 68%, and in that case, the local um, uh, elections governance was able to implement this within four months. Wow. Whereas it takes years for uh, ranked choice voting to get implemented. That's incredible. And it wasn't a, a huge capital expense. They weren't buying new machine, you know, tons of new technology or anything Correct. like that. They didn't have to buy anything new. It didn't increase ballot length because the ballot complexity doesn't increase. You don't have like a grid like you have to uh, use with the ranked choice voting. Um, and you have like some trivial educational cost um, in there, but nothing substantial in terms of overall cost. Mm. Now, my instinct is that you implement a method like this, you're going to start to see more center candidates uh, gain traction. And is, have we seen any evidence to that, to that effect in these, in these uh, cities that you've been implementing it in? I think we've seen evidence of uh, consensus candidates uh, doing a good job. Uh, so for example, in St. Louis, uh, the way that St. Louis implemented it was so previously St. Louis had uh, partisan primaries and then uh, general with all the candidates from their respective parties uh, duking it out in the general election, which is a little bit weird for municipal elections. Typically, they tend to be nonpartisan. And so the measure that we worked with the local community on was changing it to nonpartisan and having the primary part be open, you can pick as many as you want, and then the top two go on to the general. So previously, what had happened was within the Democratic Party, there was vote splitting all over the place, particularly within the progressive and black community. And someone, uh, they elected a the mayor who really wasn't that representative of the city. In fact, there were some protests in St. Louis, and the mayor doxed all oh, the protesters, like giving their personal information away. So uh, yeah, someone who Jeez. really didn't appear to have the citizens uh, in her heart. Uh, and uh, right after pool voting passed, the uh, that former mayor decided not to run again uh, after it was clear that she wasn't going to be able to take advantage of vote splitting, which she had done previously because there were a number of black candidates who had run and they had divided their vote among each other. And so none of them wound up winning as a consequence. And this is very common. Like, it's really uh, unfortunately normal in races where you have a bunch of candidates running and they talk to each other and say like, hey, you know what? I know we share a lot of uh, similar values and we talk about the same uh, particular issues, but you know what? If we both run, like we're going to split the vote. And so one of us needs to drop out. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Like that is not democratic. Mm -hmm. Like we, they should not be having to have those discussions. Um, and so so you have this kind of like uh, chicken issue with it, like these uh, folks, like basically seeing who's going to be the 
the first to, to back down or, or drop out. Um, and so as a result, there was vote splitting in the previous election. But after approval voting was limit, uh, was uh, implemented, didn't have that issue. Uh, you saw um, uh, the vote splitting in the black community was was addressed because you could, again, support multiple candidates. And the same thing in the progressive community. Like a lot of major cities, St. Louis is a bit more progressive uh, than the general population. And so what happened in the election using approval voting after it was passed is uh, that two progressive women candidates uh, made it into, like, got the most approval votes in the open primary. Then they went into the general and then they went head to head in the general. Uh, and the general, like the uh, Tashara Jones won and, won, and she became the first black woman mayor ever elected in the history of St. Louis. Um, but also just like, keep in mind, like who made it to the general? You had two women and you had two progressive candidates. Like In other systems, like you would expect that you'd have vote splitting along those lines. Like they the would other. divide their vote. But yeah. yeah, but when you can choose more than one candidate, you don't have that issue. Uh, it's the, the whole dropping out, um, scenario. I mean, we've seen it so many times in the, the presidential elections, you know, the, the primary race is, it's essentially a sport on TV. You know, it's, it's a total spectacle. Um, and I always worry that the actual infrastructure, the, the entire industry of the election process is would be preventative of of i mean we elections should be kind of boring <laughs> you know like it, it you know it, it and uh i i wonder a lot about you know the the infra, the current infrastructure the the industry of the election preventing this kind of stuff happening and that there's actual incentives both monetary and uh obviously political to prevent approval voting from taking place um does that how do we work on the marketing of approval voting? How do we get people to understand this, this, this process? And I think a big part of it is, is transparency because people need to, an election doesn't work unless voters and candidates accept the results. So how does approval method address this? You know, how can we be transparent, but also be really good at marketing to the local pop, to general populations? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that that's a question that we've uh, nailed quite yet. Uh, so in terms of recognizability, um, so far, ranked choice voting is uh, leading in, in that respect. Uh, they were able to jump quite a bit after getting RCD implemented in Maine. Uh, approval voting, while it's been implemented in two cities, has yet to um, be at the state level yet, uh, although we are working in that direction. Um, we expect to um, announce a statewide uh, effort uh, with a partner um, over the next uh, uh, year uh, for the really? 2024 cycle. Um, so we are uh, we are getting there in, in terms of in terms of that, um, but it's it's challenging. So I think like um, this isn't an issue that's particularly salient uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so I think that creates some obstacles. So uh, we do the work that we can within our capacity and to the extent that reporters will listen to us uh, uh, about uh, our work um, and also highlighting how other voting methods uh, work well and when they don't work well. Uh, for instance, like we've spoken with folks about like how, it, for instance, in Maine, uh, there was an RCV election where I thought RCV did okay, like in terms of uh, uh, performance. There was a, a Republican candidate, candidate, uh, who's this Polkwin, um, and there was some vote splitting going on, and RCV like a, uh, addressed the vote splitting with uh, with like a third party candidate, and the uh, um, the really generally correct candidate uh, won under uh, RCV, uh, and I thought that was uh, that was good for it. Uh, although keep in mind that the the candidate that was causing the vote splitting, the third party candidate, got an arbitrarily uh, low amount of support because RCV does a, actually a bad job in terms of cash, capturing candidate support. Uh, we saw that, like also in another election in Maine, where the third, where the Green Party, a Libertarian Party, when RCV was used in the state presidential election, and 
uh, there the candidates didn't know better under RCV than they would have uh, otherwise. Uh, so we do try to point out when a voting method does uh, well. Also keep in mind that virtually any voting method other than our choose one method um, would have chosen the right winner in that case, including a, a regular runoff. Um, but there are other instances that we point out where um, some voting methods don't do so great. Uh, so for example, in the special election where ranked choice voting was used in Alaska, uh, that was the one with uh, uh, Begich, uh, Patola, and Palin. Uh, in that election, we looked at the raw uh, voter data. And when we looked at that, we saw some of the weird anomalies that can come up in ranked choice voting. So for example, one of the more peculiar ones was that had a segment of voters who ranked Palin as first and Begich as second, had they just not shown up, just like didn't go to vote, they would have gotten a better outcome. So we know looking at the mm-hmm. voter data that uh, Begich would have been able to beat everyone head to head. He was that Condorcet candidate, that Condorcet winner. Um, but what happened in the actual election was uh, Begich had the fewest first choice votes because of that center squeeze effect that we talked about earlier. And uh, so his enough of his votes transferred over to Patola for Patola to win in the special election. Now, what's interesting is had um, uh, had Palin uh, gotten eliminated first, uh, enough of her votes would have shifted over to uh, Begich and Begich would have won, which is why had a segment of voters who ranked Palin as first and Begich as second. Uh, so you know what their preferences are. And you know that uh, their ideal order of people winning would have been like Palin, then Begich, then Patola. So had a segment of them just not voted at all, it would have caused Palin to get eliminated first. And enough of her votes would have transferred over to Begich for Begich to win. Um, I see. So they, they were worse off by having voted. Because if because they voted, it caused Begich to get eliminated first and Patola won. And that's their worst outcome because they ranked him last. They, they ranked Patola last. Um, but uh, yeah, had they just not shown up at all, it would have changed. Who got eliminated first and they would have gotten a better outcome. Is is this the central issue behind ranked choice voting from your perspective? You know, this that it still has the center squeeze effect? That's a big one. I mean, yeah. we want candidates who... Um, are more consensus that appeal to the broadest base of, of voters. And ranked choice voting just doesn't do that in complicated elections. And on top of that, uh, we've done other research looking at Democratic primaries. And when we put these systems up against each other, um, so asking how people would vote under ranked choice voting, approval voting, or choose one method. And we also throw in a control measure, which is asking them like, what do you honestly think about these candidates and tell us on the scale? Um, so when we when we do that, we see that sometimes ranked choice voting gets the right winner. But keep in mind that sometimes virtually any voting method or any reasonable voting method will get the right winner. Um, but one of the areas it really messes up on uh, is it does a really poor job of capturing candidate support. And so, for example... Uh, when you had in uh, 2020 a more crowded uh, Democratic primary, for instance, when uh, Andrew Yang was was running, he got under 10% with both our choose one method and with um, ranked choice voting when we when we use that to, to poll. But under approval voting, he got 30% approval. That's a threefold difference, mm-hmm. um, and that can change the way that you're treated in the media, whether you get invited on debates. Because they, they use that uh, that information to make all kinds of decisions. Uh, but when you have a voting method that doesn't know how to capture information correctly, like ranked choice voting doesn't and like our choose one method doesn't, it can cause you to make all kinds of bad decisions. In In the Type 1 Planet project, a big part of what we're attempting to do is, is incorporate art into some of these ideas. And uh, something that comes to my mind is, I, I want to see uh, the story, like for example, this remarkable story of St. Louis, like being told, in, you know, possibly in a documentary of this person who's come up, you know, in through this system and how it worked and what it looked like. And I think 
because I would love to see this sort of system be de- demystified. And part of the, the attempt of demystification is this interview here um, and shown that it's valuable and that that these candidates who represent the people, represent a majority of the people, uh, are being brought to the table in, in a way that works. Um, so this is this is really remarkable. Thank you. Um, I want to bring it back to technology a little bit here. Um, let's say we have approval, uh, me- the approval methods being implemented. Um, you know, democracy and election technology is going to be a big focus on this podcast. And we're, we would hope to have roundtables and collaborations. And one of our previous interviews is uh, with Bruce Schneier. And he's written the books and has done a lot of work in safeguarding election technology. So let's talk a little bit, you know, would this, so we've gone over the, the standing election infrastructure. It could, it could work. Um, Bruce tells us that voter verified paper ballot or the electronic counter, it's like a blended method is the really the only truly verifiable and safe election technology. Um, do you have any reactions to this? how would, would approval look okay on an all digital version or a futuristic blockchain version, or, you know, what kind of technologies do you promote or does your uh, organization promote? Uh, We tend to remain a little bit independent uh, from that area, Uh, but best practice is to to use anything that has a verifiable paper trail. Um, And so like, but if it's only digital, that's typically not good. Um, Particularly if you want to be able to audit, the election itself, which is just good practice. And approval voting lends itself very well to that. So for example, like the, the way that risk limited uh, auditing works is you take a, a sample of the, uh, of the ballots and um, you use statistics to see like whether there's actually a meaningful difference between your sample and what the recorded result was. And you take progressively larger samples until um, uh, to uh, look to see whether there was a, um, a meaningful difference. And when you when you're looking when you're using approval voting data, one of the nice things about that is that it's very simple data, um, and it works really well for this kind of statistical analysis. Um, ranking data is uh, particularly when you have all these different types of combinations of orderings. Can be really challenging. Um, now, it's not to say that it's impossible to do uh, that kind of auditing with ranked choice voting, which uses ranking data, but it's way harder. Um, mm. Whereas with approval voting, you have very simple ballot data. It's way easier to do overall, and, mm-hmm. and that also extends like here, like we're talking about within the scope of election security. But simple ballot data makes a difference in other contexts as well. So, for instance, uh, there's something called precinct summability which uh, Could you repeat that being a, a precinct summability. Okay. Uh, what that is, is it refers to being able to take uh, totals from different precincts and then take those totals and add them together to get a result uh, versus something that's not precinct summable, which means that you have to take all the ballot data and tabulate it in one central location, um, which is more cumbersome. Uh, but with ranked choice voting, for instance, you have to do that. You have to take all the ballot data and put it together in one location, which can be really challenging when you're talking about elections at scale, uh, uh, the um, uh, chain of custody issues become a little bit more more challenging uh, versus being able to look at that at the, at the local level. So with approval voting, like you have, um, you can take... Uh, Totals at one precinct, totals of another, totals of another, and just add them up. Uh, with ranked choice voting, you can't do that because if, if you have different uh, orderings at, at different locations, uh, you have you can't start the tabulation because uh, a new set of ballots could change who gets eliminated first. So you have to uh, and you just have no it. way of knowing that. Yeah. Hmm. So it's way more complicated. And so as a consequence, you have to have them all in a central location uh, to be able to begin tabulating. You, you also can't even begin doing the tabulation in a meaningful way until you have all the ballots together. So like with like approval voting, just like with our choose one system, you can start right away, 
and you can just keep doing it and then like as you get like say like in a last minute ballot or you find some more ballots like you just add them to the to the pile uh and and tabulate them up you don't have to wait to go in these other rounds because there are no other rounds you just it's just very straightforward but with ranked choice voting you have to wait all and that's one reason why you can have these really long delays um after the election because it takes so long to do the actual tabulation and because i mean i could see such issues with voter perception having to centralize all of the centralize the entire system under one roof run by you know who knows who if there's if it's a small team of people that's where the voters start getting crazy if their candidate doesn't win but if you have each precinct representing themselves with a provable paper trail this is how many votes we have it, it's i think decentralization is is key here for making it more uh more transparent mm-hmm. yeah totally it's a clear win in the approval voting column mm-hmm. so let's i, I want us i don't want to wrap up but i want to be uh, cognizant of your time and the time of the listeners um so i just want to look a little bit to the future here um maybe an optimistic perspective uh let's imagine that approval voting for example it's holistically implemented across the united states every election local to national it's done on trusted and accepted and verifiable technology you know from your perspective how does our country transform what would it look like over the course of the next 100 years, if we were able to make a reality like that happen. So I think one of the long-term advantages of uh, widespread approval voting implementation is you get candidates who actually represent people as a whole. You don't have these wild uh, partisan winners that are unpredictable and uh, switch from election to election. So like right now, when we go in and we look at um, say like a, a presidential election, you, you have the candidate who wins in like the most recent election undoing everything from the last administration. Like there's nothing sustainable about that. Like to have a, this, this pendulum effect where they're just going back and forth. Whereas if you have a consensus winner where the consensus doesn't shift a whole lot from year to year and you can have more uh, calculated and, and meaningful movements uh, versus this abrupt swing where you can't predict anything. Um, that's the kind of reliability that we're looking at with with approval voting. You're getting these consensus winners that are sensitive to the pulse of the electorate and the public, um, but uh, but not so erratic um, and unpredictable that you have these wild swings all the time. It's, like, it's not like our population. Uh, one year, for instance, uh, thought uh, uh, Barack Obama was like the consensus candidate, and then the next year it thought Donald Trump was the consensus candidate, and then the, and then after that it thought that um, uh, Joe Biden was the consensus candidate. Like, no, it's the voting method having no idea where the consensus candidate is. Like, that's that's not it doing a good job. Like, it just that's the voting method saying you know what, I've got no idea. And this is me demonstrating that. Uh, what, what we want to see is uh, the candidates who are on the pulse of where the electorate is and being able to have that sustain from administration to administration, all the way from president uh, and all the way down to our local government, uh, where we can have people who actually represent our interests and we're not, and, and being able to have sustainability with policies that we can uh, rely on over a longer period of time to have our interests in mind. I think the key term there is longer period of time. And, you know, just <laughs> seeing the fact that we want our civilization to be sustainable, to be stable. Uh, and we have to learn how to make decisions as a country in a way that works, that, that you know, people can can accept and say, yes, this is what the majority of, of human beings want. And and uh, I think it does. The, you know, we do align with the center in many ways. You know, I, we've been using that term a lot and center left, center right. It, we all kind of are coiling around this. This one concept, which is, you know, it's it all kind of comes back to the middle in some ways. And it seems that whole infrastructure that we have now is designed to push us to the outer extremes. Be, 
to be at the end. It's important to to like remind ourselves too, like the the middle varies based on what the electorate or population is. Right. So, like for instance, the the middle in rural Texas is different than the middle in San Francisco, for for example. Um, uh, but when we're talking about the middle or like this kind of where the consensus is, uh, wherever uh, population is being represented, like their consensus should be the one that we focus on. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. I hope we can bring you back in. I'm going to hit you up after the interview and see who else you think I should be speaking with or someone you people you'd like to debate or collaborate with. And maybe we can uh, keep this conversation going and make something happen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you.